first in high definition from the station on your side. This is Wavy News 10. We begin with breaking news out of Norfolk. And that's where police fire and the bomb squad are now responding to a call about a suspicious package outside of Waterside. Tonight's side's Jason Marks is there now. So, Jason, what's going on? Well, I can tell you the bomb squad has cleared up here from Waterside. They tell us that that package was actually a briefcase that was lying on the docks beside the building. Now, let's show you what the scene looked like just a short time ago. We're told that call came in around 3.30 this afternoon. Someone walking along the docks noticed that briefcase lying by itself. And I talked with officials who said that's what made this serious because that briefcase was by itself. No one was around. So what they did is they partially cleared out Waterside. They the part, the box side of the building and some of the docks here. They went ahead and evacuated those parts, got everyone out uh, as the bomb squad moved in. Now, as you can see, the robot was called in. The robot actually uh, went to go check out what that package was, uh, got up to the briefcase, which was lying flat on the ground. As they said, the robot checked it out. Uh, then an officer came in, took another look, and what they did is they shot a, a high-powered dose of water into that briefcase to actually open it up determined that there was nothing inside. Now, uh, officials obviously taking no chances here. Very serious situation, not knowing what was in that briefcase. But as it turns out, nothing was there. Uh, police say that it was probably just somebody who set down that briefcase, forgot it was there, and, and it forgot to come back and pick it up. But uh, what was at first a very serious situation has turned into a no situation here at Waterside as everyone is cleared out. Nothing in that package. So that's the latest here at Waterside. Jason Marks, 10 on your side. Well, we're learning more about a deadly ambulance accident in Hampton. The patient who was being transported later died at the hospital after Saturday night's crash. Okay. Happened at the intersection of Armistead Avenue and Mercury Boulevard. And that is where we find 10 on your side's Melanie Woodrow this evening. Melanie, what can you tell us? Well, Hampton police are telling me that they're not going to release the patient's name, the patient that passed away after this crash unless they determine that the accident is what caused that patient's death, not some pre-existing condition the patient may have had. That person's name is just one unanswered question this evening. Yes, sir. They're usually the ones helping others, but Saturday night, four emergency responders needed to be rescued. This ambulance was going north on Armistead Avenue when an SUV crashed into it at the intersection of Mercury Boulevard. They were um, responding what we consider code one, which is lights and siren. According to witnesses, they stopped at the intersection and proceeded through when they were struck by a vehicle. Lieutenant Anthony Chittum with the Hampton Fire Department said four EMTs and two people in the SUV were taken to area hospitals. All had minor injuries, but a patient inside the ambulance later died at the hospital. It's too early to speculate on that, who's at fault or what happened. Um, Two days later, Hampton police say they are still not sure. They also would not say whether or not the patient's family has been notified. Uh, Benny Sales and his wife were at the intersection as the crash occurred. I was terrified and he was just calm as can be, just doing stuff he normally does. Before firefighters and police officers responded, yep, Benny so jumped in. I just did what I was compelled to do by God, to help. And you'll hear the rest of Benny Sales' amazing rescue story tonight, new at 6. By the way, 10 on your side put in a freedom of information request to find out more details about the patient in that ambulance, what that ambulance had initially been called for. We expect to hear back within five days, and as soon as we hear something, we'll of course let you know. Reporting live in Hampton, Melanie Woodrow, 10 on your side. A man accused of stabbing his five-year-old son to death will remain in a mental hospital for at least another year. 33-year-old Joseph Hagerman waived his right to appear in today's mental review. A Virginia Beach judge ordered Hagerman to, review, to remain in a state mental facility until his next review in September of 2012. Hagerman admitted to killing his five-year-old son in 2009 at their Sugar Creek Drive home. Police also found the boy's mother in the home with some injuries. Virginia Beach police arrested two people for trying to pull off a bank robbery. Detectives say 20-year-old Lauren Polina walked into the BB&T bank along Holland Road on Saturday morning and handed the teller a note demanding money. Witnesses noticed 26-year-old Jesse Grady lurking outside. Police arrested both of them who were not far from the bank. The suspects are from Ohio.
Another shot in the fight to keep a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier here. Hampton Roads lawmakers are calling on the new Chief of Naval Operations to reassess the proposal to move a carrier to Naval Station Mayport in Florida. Well, today, Virginia Senators Jim Webb and Mark Warner and Congressman Randy Forbes, Rob Whitman, Scott Rigel, and Bobby Scott all sent a letter to Admiral Jonathan Greener. Now, it says... At a time when the nation's historic fiscal challenges will require drastic cuts in federal spending, it's not fiscally responsible or strategically necessary to build expensive and redundant nuclear support infrastructure when there are more cost-effective alternatives to sustain Mayport's future as an operational base. All the Navy's East Coast nuclear-powered aircraft carriers are based at Naval Station Norfolk. The Navy proposed moving a carrier to Mayport, Florida for national security reasons. Lawmakers cite a new Navy assessment that there is a low risk of a terrorist attack in the Hampton Roads area. Well, it certainly felt like we were in the tropics this weekend, didn't it? All that rain and yeah. yucky. Kind of yucky, though. It was kind of, yeah. <laughs> the latest update from the tropics just came in, too. And Tony Sai Chief Meteorologist Don Slater standing by with all of those details. Don? Well, there's nothing really uh, uh, threatening our area other than the fact that it feels very tropical into the area. Uh, and, of course, we had some tropical-like rains Friday, Saturday, Sunday into the area. Ophelia has dissipated. That was the latest one uh, that we had seen as of last week. But early, early Saturday morning, uh, Philippe was born in the far eastern Atlanta. Atlantic, and Philippe is expected to move on off to the northwest and then north here eventually. Uh, so it is of no threat to our area as it moves on northward. Now the hurricane season has got a bit to go, uh, really until at least October 15th. After October 15th, we can breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief, and then things really taper down uh, by November 1st. So again, there is Philippe in the far eastern Atlantic, and the remnants, of course, of Ophelia uh, are uh, threatening uh, Puerto Rico. But for us, we're going to see gradual improvement. Uh, there's a low pressure area that's been stuck on up into the northern part of the United States into the Great Lakes region and that f tends to funnel all kinds of moisture on up into our part of the world some tropical humidity as well and that's where we continue to see the rainfall throughout the area today not so much uh, but we could still see some rain coming up in the next couple of days we'll tell you about that with our forecast it'll be coming up in just a few minutes Newport News police say that someone shot a 75-year-old man during a home invasion. It happened just before 3 this afternoon along Garden Drive. That's off of State Route 167. Investigators say that when the victim answered the door, two suspects forced their way in. One of them shot the man during a fight, but he was able to call 911. No word yet on the victim's condition. Virginia Beach school board members are speaking out about a fellow board member. She refuses to step down and is now living in Saudi Arabia. Sandra Smith-Jones offered her resignation, then she withdrew it. Board members find the matter distracting. If you're elected by the folks, you need to be there 100%. You need to do the job, and you need to represent the, the students and the parents in that district. Now, right now, my personal opinion is they don't have the kind of representation they deserve. There is talk of a possible recall election. Reporter Andy Fox has more on this distracting problem facing the Virginia Beach public school system tonight at 6. A Bloomberg Business Week ranks two local cities among the best. Virginia Beach ranks number eight on the publication's list of America's 50 best cities. Bloomberg Business Week says the beaches, the boardwalk, and parks make Virginia Beach a beautiful place to live. And... Chesapeake, Chesapeake's parks, schools, great air quality, and the Great Dismal Swamp got it the number 21 spot on the list. Raleigh, North Carolina ranks as the best place to live in the U.S. because of its restaurants, social scene, and cultural institutions. A local woman charged with killing her 90-year-old mother appeared in court. We'll tell you how police say murder happened in her own home, new at 5.30. A showdown on Virginia's eastern shore. It's time for the state of Virginia to stand up and tell the federal government to back off and leave us alone. Why a small community is fighting big government. A terrifying ordeal for tourists. Their bus burst into flames. Here from one of the passengers. You're watching Wavy News 10 at 5 with Tom Shad, Nicole Libus, and Super Doppler 10 Chief Meteorologist Don Slater. Two Virginia College students are still in the hospital tonight after a fraternity balcony railing collapsed. 
It happened early Saturday morning at the University of Virginia. Police say the young men were sitting on the railing when it gave way. It fell about 17 feet to the ground. A 20-year-old James Madison University student is listed in critical condition right now with life-threatening injuries. An 18-year-old UVA student is listed in good condition. Firefighters say 50 tourists are lucky to be alive after the bus they were traveling in burst into flames. Now, the bus was on a highway near Sydney, Australia, when the driver noticed flames at the back. The passengers got off the bus and they moved down the road just before that vehicle exploded. Whoa. We were on this bus and all of a sudden the flame just burst from the backside and then people got a start of panic and then we came out of the bus and then after like 20 minutes, the bus is gone. Wow, they are lucky. No one was hurt. Another bus picked up the tourist and they continued on their journey. A cup of coffee might be good for you well beyond the last drop. We'll tell you what added benefit may come from your morning jolt. A tiny town says its livelihood is at stake. Why an eastern shore community is fighting the federal government. A quiet island community on Virginia's eastern shore is turning into a battleground. Yeah, the National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are proposing some changes on Assateague Island National Seashore, and it is not sitting well with the folks in the town of Chincoteague. Ten your sites, Art Khan's looking into this story for us. Art, what'd you find out? Well, first of all, Stephanie and Alvita, let me just tell you that formulating a general management plan, which is what this is all about for national parks, is a process that occurs about every 15 to 20 years. And although there are four different proposals under consider consideration, watermen on Chincoteague Island say all have one common denominator that would devastate commercial fishing on the eastern shore. This is what Chincoteague Island is most famous for. The annual pony swim that attracts thousands of tourists and raises money for the local fire department. But for local watermen at Tom's Cove, aquaculture and commercial fishing are the primary sources of income. Without the Tom's Cove area, we're done. All watermen are done. Watermen like Eric Weimer. Weimer says increased regulations from the federal agencies that manage the Assateague Island National Seashore and Wildlife Refuge will put him and other commercial fishermen working in Tom's Cove out of business. They want to change the complexity of the whole island, of the whole way of life. Good afternoon, I'm Robin Rothschild and welcome to the Wallops and Astig Islands Report. In this interview on the local radio station, refuge manager Lou Hines clarifies what has become to many the battle line. Anything below the mean low water is either state jurisdiction or falls into the boundary of the National Park Service. Anything above the mean low water mark is my jurisdiction and would fall under the purview of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Looking at the map, you can see that U.S. Fish and Wildlife has jurisdiction over most of Tom's Cove, and the Park Service's boundary extends a half mile beyond that into the Atlantic Ocean. Although the Virginia Marine Resources Commission has jurisdiction over the submerged lands near shore, state laws must conform to federal regulations. Basically, they, they want to own it all and expect us to pay them to work on something that we have been years uh, building up. Jay Birch is a third generation waterman. He and the other commercial fishermen pay licensing fees to the state to harvest the local seafood, including shellfish from oyster beds on land leased by the state. It's time for the state of Virginia to stand up and tell the federal government to back off and leave us alone. We have given up all that we intend to give up. Regardless of their intentions, watermen, including Jay Birch, may have to give up something that could prove to be more costly than additional fees. All four of the current management proposals under consideration call for prohibiting the harvest of horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crab fishery is illegal within all National Park Service areas. It had not been enforced at Astig Island National Seashore, and, we're, and as such, that puts us in a bind. Actually, enforcing the ban on harvesting horseshoe crabs might put everyone and everything in a bind. And coming up at 6, we'll talk more about the impact of stopping the horseshoe crab harvest at the Assateague Island National Seashore and a proposal the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is considering that could adversely impact tourism 
for the town of Chincoteague. Art Khan, 10 on your side. Now, in high definition, your Super Dot for 10 forecast with Chief Meteorologist Don Slater. We were all blinking a bit this morning. We did see a little bit of sunshine across a lot of the area. Uh, things clouded over again throughout the region. Of course, uh, North Carolina, you're going, what sunshine? Uh, because you haven't seen that much. You've got some rain going on there. But elsewhere out of the area, things are relatively quiet. Now, we could see a stray shower to uh, pop on into the Hampton Roads area, southeastern Virginia, the rest of northeast North Carolina, a little bit later on. Uh, they would tend to drift uh, from southeast to northwest into the area, but it would likely be after midnight. So I don't think we got a real, real big chance of rain coming up, and it doesn't look like it'll be heavy rain, especially coming up after midnight. So how are we doing after our rainy weekend? Well, we're about uh, two and a third inches above normal for the month of September for Norfolk, and for the year, almost eight and three quarters inches above normal. And we made up a little bit of uh, rainfall coming up uh, uh, for the uh, Elizabeth City area. It have been hugely below normal, as much as 11, 12 inches below normal. In fact, for the month of September, a little over an inch above normal, finally. Uh, so again, you got some good uh, needed rain there. And I think we've had enough. We've had enough of the gray weather. I think we're going to see gradual improvement. The problem is that this thing is not going to go anywhere for a few days yet. It's an upper level low pressure system. It's called a cutoff low, cut off from the main branch of the jet stream. So it's not moving anywhere. It's just sitting there and drawing up all kinds of moisture, including some tropical moisture on up through our part of the world. We saw that heavy rain during the day on uh, Friday. Of course, on Friday afternoon, we had a couple of inches of rain, two three inches of rain across parts of the area. This area of rain is not likely to move that awfully much. It'll tend to fall apart uh, before it gets here, but we could still see scattered showers, some rumbles of thunder into the area over the next couple of days. But I think we'll gradually we'll start to improve a bit, uh, and I think we'll see some breaks in the clouds during the overnight hours. There are some of those showers, again, could be drifting into uh, parts of southeastern Virginia, even into tomorrow morning, certainly along the uh, Outer Banks, eastern North Carolina, some scattered light rain. Here's where things are at the noon hour for tomorrow. Still cloud cover, stray shower to possible, and we could even see a rumble or two of thunder out of some of this action coming up tomorrow afternoon. But again, there are really just kind of speckles that are out there. It isn't real, real widespread in terms of rainfall coming up during the day tomorrow. With that southerly breeze, we'll see things warm back on up to around 80 or the low 80s. Now, for Wednesday, future track is showing uh, lots and lots of sunshine. There are some other forecast models, though, that do show a little bit of rain, a little bit more rainfall into the area earlier than 7 o'clock in the evening. You can see this starting to lift northward as of 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, but generally, things are going to be improving throughout the region, and they improved a little bit for today. We didn't see as uh, much rainfall into the region. In fact, most of us didn't see anything as far as rainfall. Temperatures basically into the 70s to around the 80 degree mark, 75 to around 80, 81 degrees into the region for right now. Overnight, we don't drop all that much. We'll likely drop on down into the upper 60s, around the 70 degree mark. But there is that slight chance of rain during the overnight hours, and there is a chance of rain coming up tomorrow during the afternoon. In fact, there could be a rubble or two of thunder. It'll likely be around 83 for tomorrow, a little bit more sunshine and a lot more sunshine coming up on Wednesday, but still a slight chance of rain 85, 82, 80. Now I'm going to stand off for the big surprise. Ta-da! For the weekend, temperatures drop back on down as a cold front pops through, moves that low out of the way, and really cools things off for the upcoming weekend. Things you should sink your teeth into. We're on your side with the so-called Furious Five Foods and Nutritionists Say Fight and Prevent a Deadly Disease. Mm. And NASA's space junk flew out of the sky over the weekend. We'll tell you when and where it landed. Plus, is this video from a Norfolk team, the plunging space junk? Find out what NASA said new at 530. Nutritionists say that certain foods can actually be lifesavers. On that list, watercrest. It has twice the calcium of milk, it has twice the iron of spinach, and it is much, much richer in folic acid, um, vitamin A, C, E, B6. I mean, it is absolutely a super, super food. Who knew? Really? Well, the furious <laughs> five of fighting cancer also include walnuts, avocado, guava juice, and berries. The good thing about foods is that you can't overdose on these foods. Unfortunately, sometimes when people extract one or two in, of the nutrients from the foods and then add them as capsules or supplements, sometimes we get a, an effect we're not expecting. 
Nutritionists say the foods are both cancer fighters and cancer preventers. They protect your DNA from the damage that leads to cancer. Bring on the guacamole. Mm -hmm. And the coffee. Java does more than give you a jolt of energy. Harvard researchers say that coffee may lower the risk for depression in women by as much as 20%. Decaf eh, doesn't have the same effect, though. The key is likely the caffeine, but researchers didn't have enough data on caffeinated soda or tea drinkers to know for sure. I've seen a number of women who are already depressed, middle-aged women who tell me that caffeine does more for them than any of the other medications around. We don't have a good way to prevent depression these days. There are some treatment, but uh, the, of course prevention would be much more effective. Well, doctors say it is way too early to start prescribing coffee. Genetics and a number of lifestyle factors affect a person's risk for depression. Some people have complained about Facebook's facelift, but not a Tennessee woman, how her friends helped her after a crime. And a warning, before you sit down for dinner tonight, you'll want to see this before taking a bite out of a mushroom. New on Wavy News 10 at 5.30. Hello, test I'm one, here. two, three. Can you hear me? Raper. Hello there, my dear friend. Uh, hey, uh. A Tennessee woman found a unique use for her Facebook account, reporting a robbery. You see, police say that a man forced his way into a Chattanooga home, held the victim at gunpoint, then stole cash and her cell phone. Well, since she didn't then have a phone, 20-year-old Rolanda Hill used her computer to report the crime to her Facebook friends and asked them to call police. Detectives are following up now on leads, but don't have any arrests yet. Stay with us. Wavy News 10 at 530 starts right now.